All right, I think we're going to get going here. I uh, just want to say hi to everyone and welcome to day three of One Country uh, Project's inaugural Rural Progress Summit. Uh, we've already had two phenomenal days of conversation covering everything from the future of work to uh, rural disinformation and uh, how policy goals in rural and urban in America can be aligned and, and so much more. Uh, we've also heard from Sister Simone and uh, Whitney Kimball Coe on life, community, and faith in rural America, uh, wonderful topics. And today I'm very excited uh, to uh, hear some of our, our speakers. We're going to start off with uh, Tim Lewicki. Uh, he's an author of a new book called Why Trump, uh, which will be he's going to get into. Uh, very interested in hearing about that. And from Laura Quinn from Catalyst, uh, we will have Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist Art Cullen uh, from my neck of the woods. Uh, then we have radio host Tyler Axney, author and researcher uh, David Daly, and many, many more. So I hope you can uh, tune into a lot of these. There's going to be a lot of great discussion being uh, had today. I'll also be joined on a panel of 2022 candidates, I'm sorry, 2020 candidates to share their lessons learned and advice for future candidates. Uh, but let's get started. So for this section, we're, this is the disinformation section. Uh, the issue of disinformation and misinformation has come to the forefront over the last several years. Uh, disinformation cuts across all parts of the country and across many different issues uh, areas as well. However, there's been a marked increase on the impact of disinformation in rural communities. We've put together a terrific lineup of speakers to address some of these impacts of disinformation and how we can combat it and also how to define the true scope of the problem. So our first speaker is going to be Tim Blicky. Uh, he's the author of Why Trump. And Tim was born and raised in Cologne, Germany, but lived in the United States for 15 years, during of which he got his uh, a bachelor degree at, uh, in political science at the University of Chicago. And he's got his PhD in international relations. After completing his dissertation, he worked as a postdoc scholar at the Merchant Center in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, between 2018 and 2020, Tim and a photographer, Sonia Niemeyer, traveled across the United States to interview Americans of all walks of life uh, on why they believe Donald Trump became president. The book will be released on November 1st here in, two, in 2021, so just a few weeks away. And it'll be the first part of a three-part series called The Crisis of the West, which tries to understand the political crisis and increasing polarization in Western societies. In 2019, Sonia and Tim co-founded Transatlantica, a network of independent scholars, artists, academics, experts from both sides of the Atlantic dedicated to the goal of, uh, to promote transatlantic relations and to developing creative solutions to cross uh, to, uh, to the crisis of the West. Uh, Tim, I want to welcome you to the Rural uh, Progress Summit. Yes, well, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, J.D. Shulton, for the great introduction. Um, thank you also to Senator Heitkamp, who invited us to join the conference and is promoting our book. We're really grateful. We're excited to be here. Um, as uh, Mr. Shulton just said already, usually there's two of us. Sonia Niemeyer is the co-founder with me and co-author, you could say, for Why Trump, um, but uh, she's sitting in the other room next door, so I'm extra nervous because, uh, yeah, I better not screw up here. So today we want to talk about our book project, Why Trump, um, and we have a little um, visual material there. If Tom could maybe pull this up, that would be great. So I'm going to talk a bit about the book project itself um, and some key insights. And then I'm going to relate this to the um, topic of this panel here today, disinformation, misinformation. Um, let me say up front, I, I, those terms are difficult, I think, uh, speaking as a social scientist. But I'm going to be a little bit provocative and say that... Um, or make the case, try to make the case that this information, misinformation is maybe not the problem, or at least not the problem you think it is. 
Okay, let's get started on the book. Um, there's the cover. Um, Sonia and I, we drove around the country for two months. That was the first initial road trip. And there you see the route we took across the United States. We started in Kingston in upstate New York, made our way down the East Coast, and then cut across. Um, Columbus was on the route, Kalamazoo, so not just big cities, Des Moines, Gothenburg, and Nebraska, and then all the way to the West Coast. So we traveled about 6,200 miles. Um, and then we did two other follow-up trips in the winter of 2018 and 2019. Over the course of this um, trip and the following trips, we interviewed 50 Americans of all walks of life, as we said already. So here you have an overview of everybody. You see a photo there of Anna Klumsky, some of you might from know from Veep. And my girl, you see Martha Nussbaum, the famous philosopher from Chicago. But we also have some just very regular folks, some farmers from Nebraska, um, some Latino um, folks from LA, everybody basically. So this makes obviously for a very fascinating sort of collection of interviews. Um, why did we do interviews? Well, because the surveys, the or the impetus, the original motivation for um, doing this kind of project was obviously the election of Donald Trump in 2016, which came to many of us, including myself, as a complete shock and surprise. Um, what was also interesting about this event is that all the surveys had basically predicted that Hillary Clinton would win the election. So my intuition was there's something wrong with the surveys. So um, in my um, PhD education, I was more of the qualitative type and I sort of could get into a big discussion now why, what uh, benefits interviews have compared to surveys, but uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna spare you that. But basically just to give you a brief idea, Interviews are a much better way to sort of dig into the deeper reasons for, let's say, political frustration, why people feel increasingly frustrated um, with the establishment, um, et cetera. As you can see on the, um, this is sort of an excerpt from the book. Um, we also work extensively with photos. And photos have the advantage that you get an impression of the people we actually talk to. Um, it sort of humanizes the discourse, right? That, for example, was a very conservative couple, but you see just two very nice, friendly looking Americans. And photos, <laughs> thank you. See, they look very nice. <laughs> and um, photos also allowed us to capture the beauty of America. And that is one thing, uh, if we talk about polarization, one thing that Americans from both sides, uh, from the left and the right, can agree on, that they share a love for their country. And uh, we didn't want to just examine the reasons why there is increasing polarization. We also wanted to find a way to bring Americans back together, which is kind of funny if you think about two Germans trying to bring Americans back together. But um, that was sort of the motivation. Um, so some of the key insights from the project. Oh, oh let me first, we have um, the book will be available on November 1st. Um, we are not selling the book on Amazon for some obvious and some not so obvious reasons. Um, but it will be available only on our website, transatlantica.com. And Transatlantica is written with a K. So um, you'll find it by Googling. Um, Okay, let me get into some of the key insights um, or some of the surprises. I mean, ideally, you read the book yourself. This is kind of um, the other idea behind this somewhat unique approach that we took. We have 
we didn't comment on the interviews extensively. We basically just shortened the transcripts, edited them a bit for readability. But in the end, we print uh, the interviews verbatim, which means it's also not um, suitable for children because there's some cursing going on, mild cursing in some cases. Um, so I want to still highlight some of the key insights. There's a lot of material. It's, it's sort of a resource to stimulate your own thinking about the problems that we are facing nowadays in our democracies. And as the um, subtitle of the book already indicates, we have similar problems here in Germany. We have similar problems in the um, European Union. And uh, we just lost the United Kingdom um, during Brexit. Um, so let me just highlight some surprises, some things um, that we didn't expect. First, um, if you look at the media discourse that's going on right now, there's a lot of vitriol. There's a lot of animosity going on. Uh, people cannot understand why somebody would vote for Trump. One of the biggest surprises we had during um, the, the interviews is that a lot of people on the left, a lot of Democratic-leaning voters, were actually very understanding of why people would vote for Trump. Um, so this sort of surprised us, right? Because we also are used to just seeing, reading newspapers, being on social media, and you get a very different picture there than you get when you actually talk to these people. Just sit down uh, and, for example, with the farmers you saw there from Nebraska, we sat down at their kitchen table and we just talked for an hour, right? The other insight that I thought might be of interest to especially this audience is that there was a lot of frustration um, on the left with the Democratic Party, to be very frank. Um, that was partly related to, um, well, the issue of Bernie Sanders, of course, but also how they treat rural voters, right? So we often heard the argument made by people on the left, but also obviously from people who supported Trump, that the Washington elites in general, but also the Democratic Party in particular, was sort of neglecting the um, the needs, um, interests, and beliefs of rural voters. So for that reason, we think that the One Country Project obviously is a terrific idea, and, and this conference is a terrific idea, and I think there's a lot more work to be done. Okay, I don't want to run too long and maybe leave some room for, for questions. Um, so let me get sort of to the odd argument about disinformation and misinformation. Um, I'm going to say up front, you might not like to hear that. Um, but I think nowadays, in these times especially, it is important to not just hear the beliefs of people who agree with you already, but also to listen to more critical voices. Right. So the argument I'm going to make is basically that this or misinformation, there is a difference clearly is not the problem that we might think it is, right? So clearly there's a lot of fake news, disinformation, misinformation, um, though I should caution, it has always been around, right? Uh, let's remember the time, infamous uh, time when Colin Powell was standing in front of the UN Security Council and presenting evidence for uh, the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was clearly um, mis- and disinformation, and it has tremendous consequences, right? So we're talking about different type of information at, um, here today, I think. Um, one part of misinformation, disinformation, let's call it fake news, is also that we increasingly, and we heard this in the interviews, we live increasingly in a world where we all have our informational bubbles. Right? Facebook sort of feeds us the information we like. Um, the same goes for established news outlets, like, you know, if you're liberal New York Times uh, reader, if you're on Fox News, um, you all know the problem. So 
it's not only the case that rural voters or let's say even Trump supporters live in a bubble. We live in a bubble too. And I think um, an example for this is exactly the argument that I would make. So it seems to me that especially people on democratic left, center left sort of um, um, thinkers, intellectuals nowadays think if we could only get rid of misinformation and fake news, then people would see the light. They would immediately see the one right way um, to do things to the one right set of beliefs and then they would not be so frustrated and they would hopefully even not vote for Trump but vote Democrat. And I think this is actually um, a problem. This is the real problem of misinformation. And I'm thinking here, especially, um, it's always good to think about the audience, who you're talking to. So I assume um, most people who watch right now are sort of democratic leaning, um, interested in reaching out to rural voters. And I think this argument that, you know, if we get rid of misinformation, then all of a sudden everybody's like, ah, I see the right way and the right way is Democrat. I think that's a really dangerous and problematic um, bubble we are living in. So there are two problems um, that I see in this line of thinking. So first, many people, most people, I would argue, in rural communities as well, know perfectly well that they're being fed misinformation, right? We all know about fake news. We all know that Fox News wants to give us one message and the New York Times wants to give us another message. Right? But if we consistently say, well, you know, if we get rid of fake news, then those voters wouldn't be so brainwashed. The, the effect that this has is that um, voters and those people feel like they're being treated like little children. Right? Um, especially because, again, they know they're being fed in misinformation. The second problem with the argument is, and the argument again that I kind of um, constructed there is, if we get rid of all the misinformation, then everybody sees the light. This argument um, is problematic because it assumes that there is one right way, one right way to think, to believe, and to live, right? And this is clearly not the case. Right? Rural voters have different sort of interests, preferences, beliefs, and ways of life than people in the cities. Some people um, want to drive their F-150, even though they do know about climate change. Right? So the argument that um, the whole problem would be solved if we just get rid of misinformation um, is problematic because it tells those people basically, your way of life is wrong. It's immoral, right? So democracy is about coming together with people who have different kinds of beliefs, different kinds of interests, and sometimes they just don't like the beliefs that we have, right? That's a very uncomfortable thing. It's a very difficult thing to engage with those people. But to simply say, oh, it's all misinformation, and if we get rid of misinformation, then the problem is solved actually it's going to blow back at us, right? It's going to make Trump stronger. It's going to give him more support because um, if somebody has understood this um, before any of us, I would argue then it's Donald Trump. Um, so three quick conclusions. Um, I think we should, Democrats and liberals in general, should stop taking the easy road and blame everything on misinformation or disinformation. I think the argument is wrong, and pushing this argument has bad consequences. You also have a great opportunity. Engage those people, right? Go out, talk to them, um, and offer them a way to feel like their way of life is also respected. I think that's a great opportunity. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. 
Second, um, I um, have thought about this. I used the term polarization a lot in the book, in the conclusion and in the introduction. I think it is wrong to talk about the current situation in terms of polarization because it creates this idea of one camp against the other, right? Those are the two poles. But we all know at this point that what we're actually seeing here is sort of fragmentation, right? Democrats are split along many different lines right now. Republicans, we don't even need to talk about that. The Democrat uh, Republican Party has a lot of problems right now as well, trying to figure out who they are. But I think the term of polarization is problematic because it just reinforces this idea of two combating camps. So if I'm if my argument is right that misinformation is not really the problem that we're thinking um, it is, and if the problem is not necessarily misinformation, it's just that people sometimes don't like our views, our beliefs, and opinions. Um, then that implies some good news for Facebook, right? Um, and for all the other big internet companies that are currently in the process of censoring um, the conversation, the discourse, and sort of content on the internet. The internet sort of lives um, or exists because you sort of have freedom of expression there. Um, and I don't think, again, that misinformation is the problem we think it is. And then we also don't need to censor everything there, um, which is going to just get us more um, animosity from the other side as well. So I kind of rushed through this, but I did want to leave um, some time for questions. So that would conclude my thing. I hope you're all going to buy the book. It's going to be available November 1st on transatlantica.com and I'm happy uh, to continue the conversation and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we're going to, we'll, we'll uh, give you one question and I think then we're going to uh, pass it on to, to Laura, uh, but before we get to her, um, so could you, one of the things I think uh, I see where I'm from, the, the district where I ran in is the number one district in America where uh, Democratic and Republican voters are on Facebook. Uh, we also have independent voters. And then when you add all the voters, um, it drops a little bit. But we're, we're one of the most uh, on Facebook. What, what do you see uh, Facebook's involvement in our democracy right now uh, in your journey? Uh, what what did, did that come up along the way? or Okay. Yes, that's great. I actually, uh, I accidentally skipped that. That was a, um, yes, it came up a lot, especially since we talked to a lot of people who work in the tech industry. So they really know how it's working. And they all say it's a complete disaster, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, they say it's very dangerous. Um, but again, those were mostly left-leaning people. And they also said it's dangerous for both sides, right? Facebook, as we just saw, right um clearly knows what they're doing and i also asked people from the tech community if there wouldn't be alternative ways to create sort of social media networks right and they said yes the technical means are there the problem is people wouldn't do it right and it doesn't make any money and that's also something that we took away from the book right in the end it's all up to us who's using facebook we are every one of us Right. So, yes. <laughs> uh, OK. And, and then are you going to be around for the panel, too? OK, perfect. So uh, we'll make sure that we'll, we'll include all the questions in there. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, next up, we are going to have a, a speaker, uh, Laura Quinn. She's the president of Catalyst. Um, she's a board member and uh, a president. Uh, she's the founder of the company. She served as a CEO from uh, 2006 to 2018, and Ms. Quinn previously served as the White House Deputy Chief of Staff for Vice President Al Gore as Executive Director of the U U.S. Senate uh, Democratic Technology and Communications Committee for Majority Leader Tom Daschle, and in communications and economic policy positions for U.S. Senators Jay 
Rockefeller, Carl Levin, and Joe Biden. Uh, in addition to her work in business and government, Ms. Quinn has held senior roles on five national presidential campaigns and senior management and consulting positions for numerous national and statewide political and advocacy campaigns uh, and not-for-profits. In 2018 to 2019, she was a fellow at Harvard's, uh, Harvard's Kennedy School, uh, Ash Center for Governance and Innovation, and at Shorenstein Center for Media po uh, Politics and Public Policy. Laura will join us to expand more on the issue of disinformation problem uh, between rural and urban America. Uh, Laura, welcome to the Rural Progress uh, Summit. Thanks, JD. Um, appreciate being invited. Uh, thanks to the organizers of the conference and to everybody who's taking time out of their day to participate. So I'm going to follow up on what you were just hearing um, from Tim about, um, but I'm going to um, kind of try to present what the landscape looks like, both in terms of uh, how America is reacting to the current information environment and uh, how that information has environment has changed over time and, and kind of how it's operating at the moment. Um, and I'm going to focus a lot less on content, like whose information is good, bad, getting through. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about literally how this information ecosystem works, because I think it's very hard to um, understand what is having impacts if you're not understanding the mechanics of how people are getting their information. So I'm going to try to show you some slides here, Let's see if we can get them pulled up. So are you seeing my slides okay? Yep. Okay. And uh, hopefully that's in slideshow mode at the moment. So let's start out with, I've spent um, about 40 years in this civic political government um, space. You've heard from my bio, about the first half of it, about two decades in the policy and communication space and in political campaign space. And in the last two decades, I've spent it in the data and technology space. But specifically looking at data as it relates to voters and civic behavior. So let's start with one of the questions that um, Tim brought up, which is, you know, has America changed? Are we really more polarized or not polarized? So I'm going to show you um, a graphic here. And what you're looking at, every little bubble represents a county. So the big bubbles are the big urban counties, Miami-Dade, uh, you know, uh, Manhattan, LA, Cook County, and all the little bubbles, the smaller the bubble, that's the size of the county. So those small bubbles are the rural counties. And when you see, when I start this animation, if the bubble is moving left or right, that's what the way that that county was voting. Obviously, you know, it's moving to the, the blue side, voting for Democrat, moving to the other side, moving voting for Republicans. And if, if you see the bubbles moving up and down, that's their turnout rate. So if their turnout rate was going up, enthusiasm is going up, you see those counties going, going north and south. So let me see if I can roll this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this, how America was moving over time. So I'm gonna go all the way back to another period of time when um, you know, we started to get into some pretty serious political conflicts. So let's start with, uh, sorry about that. Let's see if I can get this to roll. So let's start with the, the Nixon landslide. And then we have Watergate. I mean, America had lots of strong opinions in these days, you know, the, the war, et cetera. But as you see, you know, America was moving more together, you know, whether it was urban or rural, as the country was making different decisions. This is Reagan's landslide, then Reagan's reelection, people swinging back a little bit more the other way. Um, now we're moving into Bill Clinton's first election, his second election. You always see in those midterms, the turnout goes down, but, you know, and you see big urban counties on both sides of the divide. You see rural counties, but now with Gore, you're starting to see much more of a sort. And then this is the Kerry election, a lot of turnout, more and more of the sort is going on. 
Then you see Obama's first. Now Obama's re-election. Again, turnout goes down, but further polarization. And then this is what happened in the Trump election. So when you talk to social scientists about this kind of change over actually what is quite a short period of time, just a couple of, you know, a few decades, uh, uh, this is really dramatic change. Because now what you're looking at is America no longer sort of moving together. And you're seeing a the, the distance of, you know, from right to left is so much more spread apart. That means more and more of America is disagreeing more and more violently. And you also see this incredible sort of all of the big urban counties now, you know, thoroughly um, hearing and, and responding to the Democrats and the Democratic message. And, you know, the rural counties completely turning away from that, responding to the Republican message, and that increasing more and more over time. So something has actually happened here. And I would say that, you know, in the course of these several decades that I've just shown you, there has been serious conflict in the U.S., social conflict, civil rights conflict, war, economic downturns, up economic upturns. So, you know, what we're experiencing, what we would look at as the root causes of, you know, this kind of behavior change among the electorate is not easily explained by the things that we normally look at. And, you know, in my role in the data science side, we've looked hard to try to understand and correlate people's behavior to things like uh, racial resentment, economic pressure, indebtedness, immigra immigrants moving into their community, immigrants not being in their community, um, communities that were more homogenous, communities that were less homogenous. And it is true that when we look at those factors, um, we do see some things that correlate with this kind of change and um, tearing apart of the country. Uh, if you look at what you're looking at here with these lines is, the blue line is the gap between how urban and rural folks have been voting. And you actually see that there's always been a pretty big rural, urban rural, rural gap, um, but it's been spiking more recently. And as you look, uh, I'm sorry, if, if, if you, it's, that's the red line. If you look at, there was always sort of a, you know, a gap between how urban and rural people were, were voting and probably how they were seeing the problems of the country. But when you look at their change over time since 2006, that is incredibly dramatic. As opposed to when you look at the blue line, which is the racial divide, where um, how uh, African-Americans, people of color are thinking about and, and voting, there's always been a very big divide there between white voters and um, voters of color. But that's been more consistent and pretty steady, even with some spiking here at the end. But this rural urban change is really, really um, something to look at. The other one, the green line, that correlation to change and division that exists based on education is also, um, you know, been becoming more extreme in uh, just the last um, couple of election cycles. So what's the consequence of that? So here the bubbles are congressional districts. Um, and after the last midterm election, all the way to the right are the ur most urban districts, all the way to the left are the most rural districts. And it's pretty starkly clear. You know, the, the consequence of that polarization, that consequence in that difference in the way that the voters are behaving is literally causing the um, you know the representation in Congress to dramatically shift into a split between you know urban rural as well um, with the Democrats doing a little bit better in the suburban spaces most recently but the suburban spaces being the place that are still you know under tension and being dragged back and forth I'm going to show you just one more of these kind of geeky geeky data charts um, so sometimes people are zeroing in on the racial division and they're zeroing in on the college versus non-college division. Um, some of the times we wind up hearing a lot more about the things that the data folks tend to have data about and dig into more. But that means that some of the things that they're not bothering to look at might actually be you know, more important or as important to look at. So here again, looking at the um, last midterm election, what you're looking at on the left is, this is th this chart is only showing white voters. 
just white voters. But on the left, it's evangelical white voters. And on the right, it's non-evangelical white voters. And you can see here that the split between evangelical and non-evangelical is more dramatic than when we are just looking at the split between college, non-college, or the split between women and men. So how America is fracturing is really important to have in your head um, when you're starting to look at you know, what might be causing that. And so let me um, talk about uh, now the subject at hand, which is information. As I mentioned, when we started to look at what correlates with the changes that in voting behavior, we found good, you know, some correlation. There was some explanation when we looked at economic factors or, or race factors, racial tension, resentment. But when we started looking at something that, frankly, data folks have not been bothering to focus on and collect data about, which is where you're getting your information from, the correlations were really stark. So, you know, something that we haven't thought about a lot in the past, because frankly, everyone was getting their information from one, from inside one information stadium. So if you think about all civic and political activities conducted inside the media stadium, and so the shape and the way the media environment works has a profound effect not only on the electorate, but also on you know, how different actors in this space formulate their strategy and, and, and really have a lot to do with who's successful and who's not successful in persuading America of anything. And that information stadium that we're all operating in has changed dramatically over the course of, again, just a few decades. Um, so when we are now able to do what we couldn't do in the old days, which is you know, using machine learning to really examine the content uh, that is being produced by all kinds of news outlets, including digital, you know, news outlets. We can we can actually map the nature of the content that's being, you know, pushed out by various news organizations um, and how much reach they have. And this is, you know, a fancy data uh, depiction of that. And you see, we now have a lot of news organizations that are still producing what I would call purple news that, you know, a little bit of both. Um, but we have a, a, a huge growth of, of news outlets and information sources that are giving overwhelmingly a preponderance of information that is w on one side or the other. That just didn't exist in the past. There weren't that many news outlets and they all had pretty close to, you know, very broad reach. And they were kind of uh, crafting what they were producing to have the most appeal, frankly, so that they could hang on to the largest audience share. But that is no longer possible. Um, you're competing with a lot more if you're in the information business. So people are tending to want to carve out a niche rather than try to broadly appeal. And that is having consequences in terms of what is now available on the shelf for people to take down and look at. And it's not so much that they now have access to things that are extreme, it's that they have access to so much that they have to start picking and choosing because although there is now infinite shelf space for information, there is still finite amounts of attention that people you know, can um, devote in their own personal lives. And that's causing more and more people to just gravitate to one part of the shelf and be looking at one set of information um, and not getting that broader picture. So to make this point a little bit starker, we were all operating inside an information stadium that had a left, had a right, you know, Amy Goodman on one side, Rush Limbaugh on the other side, but everyone was getting a dose of, you know, some of all of it. Over the last several decades, long before, uh, you know, the advent of Facebook, that information ecosystem was ripping apart. And you were getting a more and more of, um, you know, two separate information arenas where people were getting less and less cross-pollination of what they weren't necessarily particularly interested in. Um, and that has been reinforced by social media and what is now available online. So what you're looking at, and I'll just show you, you know, this example, but I could show you um, examples in the other direction around what's reinforcing the old media ecosystem. The difference is, is that on the right, because I believe they felt disadvantaged by the larger um, mainstream media ecosystem for a long time, over the course of decades, there was just more work done to build 
specific networks that were reaching niche audiences that um, folks on the right were more most interested in in talking to, and frankly, were not very expensive to invest in. And that include you know Christian broadcasting, uh, talk radio. Radio became a very cheap way to uh, reach audiences and invest in. And radio has, and uh, some of these other television networks have enormous penetration, particularly inside certain communities, and particularly in rural America, where broadband and other forms of distribution are not as robust as they are in um, the urban places. So what are people are somewhat surprised when you know you show them this kind of reinforcing set of brands? These are not individual brands that are stood up by, you know, one actor in one place who's focused on one tiny niche audience. Increasingly, they are part of networks that are all owned by the same operators. So I'm just showing you, I just picked one out. This is the Liftable Network, which has scores and scores of media properties that are in the digital space, each tailoring to, um, you know, different kinds of niche audiences, but all basically getting a lot of their content produced in a central place. So that means that these new networks have as much throw weight often as you know some of the more traditional networks. When you looked in 2016 and 17, when, when the Liftable Network really exploded, it was already attracting more Facebook uh, followers across all of its brands than you know major mainstream news organizations. So the advent of these new players is really quite consequential. The fact that many of these players have a very pointed particular you know, set of information on one side or the other around some particular topic that they're driving is a new factor that just has to be taken into account when you're thinking about how and what kind of information people are getting. Um, so, uh, sorry about that. So one of the things that's important to know is that these operations, they may have a political point of view, but they are also money-making enterprises. They are, for every intensive purpose, they're commercial information and entertainment networks um, that are competing for people's attention and doing it by trying to carve out a particular niche audience for themselves. And that means that they are relying heavily on social media as their new marketing platform. So they're not necessarily trying to use Facebook as a means to, in and of itself, they're using Facebook and some of the social networks as the way that they recruit viewers, followers, um, you know, folks who are willing to check in to their brands. And then they are selling that attention to advertisers. They are um, monetizing it by selling merchandise directly. It, these are commercial enterprises as well as, in some cases, um, you know, folks with political or other issue um, objectives. And this is really quite consequential as well because a larger and larger set of America is getting at least some, if not a majority of their information from do digital information providers. So even if they're still watching some television and radio, um, they are uh, increasingly, you know, part of their diet is coming from this other new information shelf space. And let's take a minute to talk about what that shelf space looks like. Behind the scenes, and this has you know, been well demonstrated by the whistleblower um, uh, revelations that have just come out in the last week, Facebook and Google and the other uh, digital platforms are not neutral in effect in that they are not simply creating more shelf space and putting you know, anyone's material on that, those shelves. And that's the end of the story. They're doing that and they are censoring, but they're not censoring in a sense, picking the right or the left. What, what is clearly detailed in the documents that were just released um, by the whistleblower about Facebook is that their algorithms are tuned for attention, almost unrelievingly. And what that means is if something has more eyeballs or not even more eyeballs, if you if you stick with that content for a few seconds more, and I will say it's hard to wrap our brains around this idea, but they are watching billions of users do trillions of actions online, and they are measuring not at merely the milliseconds, but at the microseconds, at what you're looking at, how long you're looking, um, and what kind of response um, or comments or reaction that you're, you're having to that. And they're using that vast trove of data 
to reward any information purveyor who's getting you to stop and pause longer. That's it. They're not necessarily making a judgment about what's good or bad or left or right. But here's one of the things that they are optimizing for. In effect, it's our own brain weaknesses. Increasingly, people go to platforms not to tune into a particular program or even looking for a particular um, you know, flavor of information left or right. They just go there when they have a question. So by, by way of uh, giving you an example, so if you're thinking about vaccines and you're wondering whether you should get one, and perhaps you're pregnant, so you really, really are concerned. Like, you know, should I be worried? I've been hearing some things. You go to a platform, and it is natural, um, human, uh, normal reaction. So that if you're seeing something that's reassuring, you you tend to, you know, go by that headline and say, "Oh, the CDC says vaccines vaccines are safe." Okay, I don't have to worry about that. I move on. You're scrolling past things that are reassuring and positive. But if you come across something that says, hey, vaccines cause birth defects, you know, it is only natural that you're going to stop and say, hey, wait a minute. And you're going to read that whole article. And once you've clicked on that article, the algorithms are also saying, oh, look, this person is interested in pregnancy and birth defects around vaccines. And then it's going to start biasing that that consumers, that users feed to give them more and more of that uh, anxiety creating information. So this is why, especially for teenagers, it's pretty easy in the data to find that if you're a teenager who, not all teenagers, but if you're a teenager who's already a little bit worried and anxious, it's very easy to make that teenager much more worried and much more anxious and then keep driving them in a spiral down and down into that direction. So how these um, platforms work, what they're optimizing for is having consequences, not just in the United States, but across societies. Um, It is reinforcing what people are most anxious about, what people are potentially more angry about, um, and giving people a stronger and stronger diet of that set of information. So it's it's a different kind of censorship. It's not a censorship that's based on a political ideology, but it is certainly a, a, a set of actions that is changing the information diet of whole communities. Um, And that makes it very, very fertile ground for anyone who wants to exploit that space. You know, for people who now understand how to manipulate the algorithms, they understand that it's a great place to take any particular anxiety, fear, um, or, you know, negative attitude and amp it up. And to counter that with positive is very hard. You almost have to do, you know, some order of magnitude more of positive information like vaccines are safe to break through at an equal level because the platform algorithms are biased towards the anxiety making. And this means that it stokes what might be a low level of anxiety about any issue into something that can turn into, you know, a violent rage. And we've seen the worst of this kinds of effects in other parts of the world, frankly. And, you know, what's happening, uh, obviously, you've heard about what happened with the Rohingya uh, in uh, Myanmar, but, you know, we're seeing this kind of effects in Nigeria and in in, um, Tigray and and other parts of the world as well. And it's also the kind of thing that is fertile ground for just driving conspiracy, for making people believe that something that they think they kind of had a suspicion about was actually really true. Because, again, you're much more likely to pause and 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 uh, take just a little bit more time with something that is a little bit um, uh, reinforcing of a conspiracy than than any kind of content that's saying don't worry everything's okay. So you know how do we do something about this? I mean it's pretty tough right now. The platforms, this particular recipe of especially for Facebook of going after your attention and and allowing people to monetize your attention. I mean, frankly, that's the way television has worked for a long time. But the folks at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, has put that recipe on absolute steroids, and it is an enormous profit-making enterprise for them. You know, we're talking about a company that only, you know, a little more than a decade ago uh, or a couple of decades ago was not making any money. And now uh, this chart is old. They've already crossed the $40 billion a year net profit line. So you're talking about a recipe that is phenomenally profitable. So getting them to uh, change some of their product design that would possibly cost them a little bit of money is no easy feat in and of itself. Um, 
And, you know, there are other, you know, networks of actors that are using this kind of uh, operation to build bigger and bigger, frankly, commercial media operations that are capitalizing on this kind of recipe being um, very um, powerful. So let me say a word before I, you know, lay all the blame on the uh, doorstep of the, uh, the social media platforms in the digital space. It is important to recognize that in certain parts of the country and, and among certain uh, older folks, they're still digesting a big diet of television and radio, along with more and more of the digital um, side of things. So the older you are, basically think 45 and above you're still taking in a lot of television and radio. And the older you are, the more you're taking in. As you move lower than 45 years old, you know the youngest uh, folks are taking in less and less. They're, they're even moving away from Facebook and now they're all in Instagram and TikTok. So in the short run, um, meaning the next several election cycles, next several decades, the focus on legacy media uh, needs to be, you know, continues to be strong. Um, particularly in places where legacy media is not competing with as much digital information. And that especially is in rural America, where broadband is you know, less available. Uh, radio is still incredibly powerful. Where people spend a lot of time in their cars. And you know, some of the local, locally controlled uh, local station groups have um, you know, more trust and are more powerful and persuasive than um, national networks that are, you know, increasingly, um, the, the national network's audience is increasingly urban and um, suburban. So one last thing before I turn it over to the next speaker, a couple of things to think about when you're thinking about this new information arena, right? So the old world and the new world have some things in common. They're both, you know, systems that reach largely everyone. The At this point, in the US at least, the old legacy system still has a little bit more reach in certain rural parts of the country. But you know, it's not long before the digital side captures more and more, especially as what you can get in your handheld device becomes more and more equivalent to, than what you can get um, through broadcast devices. The second thing they both paid for by selling attention you are only able to sell attention one way in the old broadcast system, and that was by selling ads. You can sell attention many more ways in the new uh, system. You know, if you are able to, uh, you know, sell people attention for merchandising and commerce, that's as lucrative or more lucrative even, or getting folks to subscribe or become donors, you know, more like the public television uh, recipe of old. But the other thing in the political information space that's really consequential is in the old world, it was so expensive and there was so such a small amount of shelf space that really only two narratives were generally presented at scale. Because, and, and ad dollars, if you had enough ad dollars, you could buy your way in front of any audience you want. You may have thought, you know, Older people didn't want to hear your message, but you could put your message, you know, in advertising on Golden Girls or Jeopardy, and you would be sure that you were getting your message through to them. And in the old system, um, if veracity wasn't rewarded, there were penalties that could be leveled on folks who really were, you know, uh, extremely, uh, you know, mendacious. In the new world, shelf space galore, many competing narratives. No matter how much money you have, you, you don't get to buy your way in front of an audience. You've got to get them to choose you. And disinformation, as I was mentioning, is actually uh, strongly rewarded. And, and it's not just disinformation, I would say. It's sort of negative uh, information. And that is why more and more in this digital space, you have folks that are looking not to rent advertising slots next to programming. They're, in effect, building operations to own the programming itself. And you see the consequences of this in the political space where when in the old days, if you had more advertising money than your opponent, you would, you know, have a you would have a big advantage and you would likely win the day. We are regularly seeing now that even candidates who outspend their opponents are not necessarily coming up with the results that they you know, got used to ex ex um, um, uh, to expecting. Um, so more and more, as I said, we have, you know folks who really understand the mechanics of this space 
exploiting it more effectively than those who are still clinging to an understanding of the old media system. And that includes, you know, political actors, but also, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks like the Russians, the Chinese, other malign actors who have other kinds of agendas that are anti-democratic and certainly not um, good for America. Uh, and, you know, that idea of polarism uh, I think needs to also be examined. There's many ways to think about it, but understanding it and, and the way that it is becoming worse as perhaps um, partly a function of the nature, shape, and the mechanics of the media environment uh, is a very, very important uh, new set of information, new set of factors that people need to take more account of as they're thinking about all kinds of civic, political, social problems and, and how to uh, and how to make our democracy more um, functioning. And I think I'll stop there. Hope I didn't go over time. Not at all, that was amazing. Uh, you're gonna be around for a few questions with the panel, is that right, Laura? Uh, yes, I think okay. I can. Um, nope. For a little bit at least? Okay, good, because yes. I know we have a couple questions. Well, since I have you right here, let's, let's start this off um, uh, before I introduce the, the panel. Um, there was a, a question uh, about, do you favor federal legislation uh, uh, when it comes to Facebook and, and in what form? Well, there's, you know, uh, there's a number of different problems that the social media platforms are presenting to society. I guess they fall into three categories. One is there's actual criminal activity that's happening on the platforms, like just flat out, that isn't legal anywhere else in any other media environment. You know, everything from selling babies and endangered species parts and, you know, all kind. you know, people looking for opioid treatments gets getting turned over to opioid dealers, people promoting uh, you know, uh, human smuggling at the borders. Certainly, you know, a set of standards can be put in place to at least dry up the worst of the worst. That's one. The second one is this this problem of the design itself. You know, there's there's many things that you can measure that the platforms are doing. If they're if you're just measuring attention, you're going to get what we have now. But there are other ways of measuring. Are you creating more, you know, teen anxiety? And perhaps by forcing a little bit more of a um, uh, a broader set of, of metrics that they should be measured by, would um, simply forcing that to happen and exposing that would perhaps cause the, the, the platforms themselves to reconsider some of their own algorithmic design. Because I, I think even they don't want a destabilized world where we're all tearing each other apart. And then the last piece is um, sort of a really difficult one because part of the problem here is these companies have become so large that they don't really have to listen to anybody's advice, suggestions, or even potentially regulations pretty soon. Users, advertisers, um, you know, uh, their own shareholders, I mean, it's, it's reaching a point where they can bully pretty much everyone. And I think that's also including co competitors who might come up with a a different, more appealing recipe than the one they have. And I think that there's some um, reason to think that, you know, there are some curbs that need to be put in place. I wouldn't want to even begin to say I'm an expert on what any of the three categories of actual policy making should be, but there are surely three problem problem sets that should be attacked, I think. And yeah, um, it, it, what we're seeing too, uh, that what you mentioned about like they're getting so big, I mean, almost too big for any one country and, and their influence on a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and we've always counted in this country that if anything got too big, you know, the competition would keep them from getting completely out of control. At this point, they're so able to crush their competition. You know, you've got a competition policy issue that I think deserves some real attention. Right. Uh, and this kind of leads into this next question, and then we'll open up to the panel. So panel folks, be ready. Um, what role do you uh, think local news channels play in this political climate in rural areas, especially with conservative corporations like Sinclair Broadcasting buying or affiliating with local news stations and implementing uh, must runs, uh, et cetera? And is the impact of small uh, uh, comparison to the Facebook bubbles and social media phenomena? Yeah, two quick questions, uh, two quick answers to that. Um, if you believe that good information is, a, is is part of what 
democracies need to function well, you got to invest in it, right? And believing that you can um, ensure enough good information gets through just with occasional advertising campaigns, I think is a mistake. But, you know, trading one group of far removed owners who really don't understand a community very well with a different set of <laughs> far removed owners who don't understand that community well, probably might not solve the problem either. So investment that has roots in some local ownership, local management, hiring local news gathering um, capabilities, and even producing programming, you know, covering local events. It used to be really, really, really expensive to produce content. It's right. actually not that expensive anymore, but we haven't built now the capacities to uh, create more content that's of a positive you know, nature and then take what the steps necessary to ensure that that stays as close to the community that it's talking to as you can possibly get it. Um, you know, even if there's some outside investors that you've got some good, deep local ownership roots, that's the best way to protect everything from turning into, you know, one giant propaganda machine that's in the hands of any particular set of actors. That's great. Um, well, thank you, Laura. Uh, I would like to also welcome back Tim to the conversation. And then we're going to be joined by several great speakers here. So uh, first, we're going to have Art Colon as uh, he is the co-owner of the Storm Lake Times a twice uh, weekly publication out of Storm Lake, Iowa. He also won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in 2017. And because this is a rural summit, uh, he decided to wear his, uh, oh, you switched. <laughs> oh, I got him on, JD. <laughs> Here we go. We're getting the bib up. He's got his bibs. All right. <laughs> there we are. I was trying to look presentable for you, uh, you know, city pipes, city pipes. <laughs> all, right, all right. We also got uh, Tyler uh, Axness. Uh, is that how you pronounce it, uh, Tyler? It's um, uh, is He's the former state legislator who served in the North Dakota State House from 2012 to 2016. Uh, he is the publisher of a political news blog, NDX Plains, and is the host of Afternoons Live, on KFGO in Fargo, North Dakota. Welcome, Tyler. And Thanks for having me. Yeah. And Usually it we, helps us shut the mic, uh, or turn the mic uh, on, I suppose. <laughs> I think all of us have experienced uh, <laughs> mute issues in the last year and a half. And then also uh, want to bring out Will uh, Brown. He is responsible for product development and client uh, uh, incitement, or insights, sorry, client insights at Impact Social. Impact Social is a specialist social media. Um, they do online monitoring and analysis uh, company. They use data software uh, to track over 60 million online sites, including Twitter, Facebook, all blogs, forums, and news websites to provide real-time uh, look at public sentiment on key issues. So welcome, Will. Thank you. Hello from London. <laughs> oh wow, we're very international here. So, um, all right. So, uh, Tyler, I want to uh, first go to you. Uh, I have a question. Since you're in North Dakota, I'm uh, just over the river from South Dakota in, into Iowa. So, in between us is, is South Dakota. And uh, 20 years ago, or a little over 20 years ago, uh, uh, the Senate Majority Leader on the Democratic side was from South Dakota. And since that time. We have seen this shift uh, in the Midwest, especially from where you live to where I live. Uh, and could you talk a little bit about what you've seen in that time? And that's during your uh, time in politics and, and also what this information and what we're seeing right now, ha how has that played with, with the shift? Sure. Uh, and thanks again, One Country, for uh, for asking me to uh, join this panel. And uh, you, you're right, the shift has been rather dramatic, I would say, over the last eight years, 10 years. Um, and a lot of it has to go with what you're hearing from, I think, uh, uh, the, the two presenters before uh, with Tim and Laura. And I was jotting notes down of some key points, I think, that really stood out to me. And uh, starting off, and I'll start with uh, our first presenter as far as Tim goes, talking about the way of which I think uh, rural residents have, uh, I don't want to say be, been treated, but the way that at least they perceive they've been treated when it comes to just 
mainstream politics. I think for a long time there, there's been a focus on, well, uh, what's going on in rural America? They're talking about us and not really talking with us, not coming out to the cafes, not really stopping, you know, at the, the watering holes, not going to church, the community centers. So I think over time there was a disconnect in, in just that trust when it comes to uh, those that, uh, you know, were the high profile individuals. So that I think was then filled that void of that communication, that one-on-one -on -one interaction or that town hall type uh, situation, uh, it was filled with, as you were hearing from Laura, some of those platforms that have been expanding in which everyone now has uh, their own ability to share their own opinion with the click of a button and find someone else that is as equally outraged about something that really isn't directly impacting their own world. Uh, and that was getting more likes. And all of a sudden, that's becoming part of the conversation. And that was drowning out, I think, that that part of politics that was so effective for so long of keeping it local, talking about the infrastructure, talking about school boards in a way that wasn't about, you know, some made up, uh, you know, theory that's now outraged people to be screaming at school board members. It was about the, the meat and potato subjects that you had at the dinner tables. And that's all now been filled with just the next social outrage thing that's got people talking and, uh, and just trying to wake up in this addiction to anger that's now filled the void of political discourse. And I don't know at what point in particular, if you could draw a line saying this was the moment it started. But, you know, being in North Dakota, I grew up in a town of 450 people, 16 people I graduated with. I live in the urban area now of 240,000 in Fargo. But, you know, I still go back there uh, from time to time. And to break through some of that now in a way of which we used to, to, to have the conversations, it, it's, it's difficult. And, and I don't know if it, because over the course of that time, as you're hearing with Laura's presentation, there was infrastructure behind the scenes when it comes to building out platforms, when it comes to investing and in filling that void through platforms, not just the traditional media, but certainly the digital media to where now that is where everything takes place. It's not at the community centers. It's not at this, uh, the town hall meetings. It's all online. I don't know how we get back or how we turn that around without serious investment and time and, and energy into that as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good uh, transition over to the art. Uh, I, you started uh, with the Storm Lake Times, or the Storm Lake Times started in, in the uh, early 90s. Uh, uh, how have you seen a shift? Uh, obviously, uh, journalism has, has changed and local journalism has changed uh, over the past few years. Uh, how, how have you seen like the, the mis and disinformation along with this? Uh, to, to go along with what you've seen. In well, now, uh, also, thanks, J.D., for having us. Good to see you again, and I uh, wish you were in Congress. But anyway, uh, 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 yeah, since we started in 1990, you know, looking back, it was the worst time to start a print newspaper, obviously. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I noticed our Republican state representative, and I was, I was, you know, pretty good friends with him. You know, we talked baseball and and uh, I noticed when I was riding with him once to a baseball game, uh, he had uh, Newt Gingrich tapes in his car. And this was, a, you know, a retired hog farmer who was never, he was a nice guy, never that political. And all of a sudden he had Newt Gingrich rumbling around in his head. And Rush Limbaugh had just come on the air about the, you know, in the 80s, I guess. Uh, and he was just becoming popular on AM radio. And I'd argue that, uh, you know, that was really, uh, when Rush Limbaugh came on, things changed. And uh, um, because he spoke in straight, direct uh, remarks that were easily understandable, even if they're patently untrue, just like Trump does. And Trump obviously studied him. And uh, I think that's when everything changed and it changed the it, now that that former state representative won't speak to me. Basically, uh, he'll wave at me and that's about it. We don't really have conversations anymore. And he sends sends me every day these incredibly crazy emails with uh, full of disinformation, not misinformation. Misinformation is just something that's screwed up. Disinformation is a lie. And uh 
he's sending me these emails all the time, just filled with lies. <laughs> and, and he thinks they're true. Uh, and that's, that's the issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, I see it too, where a lot of kids I grew up with, uh, I mean, we, we never talk politics through high school or anything like that. And now like I see them, their online version seems completely different than their, their, the version I knew of them growing up. And it's just, it's, it's, it's been an interesting past few years for me personally to go from not being into politics to being in politics and then being, uh, what what I like to say, I think a lot of people use this too, a, a blueberry and a, a bowl of tomato soup. So, um, Will, uh, what would you, what advice would you have for campaigns right now based off things that, that you guys work on? On uh, I thought Laura did an interesting job of, of showing how like things have changed from television. Uh, I, I know, uh, um, kind of the old school of, of campaigning i guess 10 old school as in 10 years ago it's heavy with mail it's heavy with uh television uh but we've seen this advancement of the digital um and, and i guess could you talk a little bit about what you would tell campaigns to uh suggest they would do right now sure, sure. so um yeah thank you jd and thank you for having me on the panel um We've been working with one country um, looking at this issue in rural counties and rural states, six or seven states, and we've been doing that for the last couple of years. We did a big piece on coronavirus and what was happening there, and we saw a lot of what Laura was talking about is 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 playing out in rural communities. So, you know, these people are uh, receiving their, their news, discussing things, reacting to things, engaging with content in the same way that, you know, we see it in other states in, in urban areas. So I think, you know, that urban versus versus rural argument in terms of how are people consuming information is, especially from the big platforms, is it's kind of agnostic. It's the same way. Um, and I think there's an interesting framing of, of, of how we discuss this stuff. And I just want to throw up this quote here because I think this is great. It's building on what Laura was saying, really. So this, this idea of ampliganda, that, that it's propaganda for the modern age, I think is is really interesting by René Duresta, who's at Stanford um, and is doing a lot of great work in this in this area of kind of misinformation. So I think, you know, there's there's this whole framing, I think Tim talked about it as well, this kind of the framing of actually what's the language of the, the kind of semantics of this is, is interesting. But what we've seen in, in rural areas is, is especially, you know, when we did this thing on, on corona, is that at the beginning of the of the coronavirus virus coming out in, in March, you know, there was this community and people were looking peer to peer and discussing things amongst themselves. And then that kind of started to change as the media came in and, and you know, as the engagement was happening in, in Facebook and all these different opinions come in. And it, basically by about week four, everyone was completely confused about what was going on. No one really knew who to trust in terms of news sources, what was the advice, you know, whether the vaccines were safe, whether we should or shouldn't wear masks. And then it became polarized and people were taking it like literally like a badge of honor. Was like, I'm not wearing my mask because, you know, why should I why should I do that? Because I've got a right to freedom. And it just became this kind of polarized mess. Um, and that is completely, you know, re it was reinforced by the algorithms that, uh, that of the social media companies. And I think there's a really important point about algorithms. You know, what we what do we do to address some of the issues? And there's the kind of platform level that Laura was talking about, you know, how do we address this at a federal level, what's happening with the platforms. But I think also there's local stuff that can be done as well. And I think part of that is really listening to local communities, local rural communities in this case, you know, for the One Country Project. What do they what do they think and feel about these issues? What are the true opinions that are down there on the, on the grounds in terms of, you know, how they're consuming news, what how they're taking their opinions, how they're taking their um their news resources, etc. So I think that understanding local voices is really, really important. That's a big part of the work that I think Heidi's trying to do with with One Country Project. And you know, this it's moving out into places like Alabama, we've been working in. Uh, again, exactly the same thing. What are the smaller issues that really are important to people's lives and how they're being discussed, I think is important. You can get beyond the algorithms if if you know if you're looking at conversations, you know, you're not looking at mass engagement. I'm going to look at in state, what are those conversations? So I think for campaigns, 
the important part is you know lo- use all those tools you can um, to look at what are the local conversations that are happening. Um, and I think that's that's really important point. Um, and then you know I think the other point is you know if you look at what's happening in the academic circles and Tim will know this. And um, you know I think there's a there's a lot of calls for you know the Facebooks and the Googles to open up their data to independent sources. You know not necessarily to government but to independent sources to academics to universities who can probably vet that data and understand. You know what are the impacts of 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 the algorithms? How can they be changed? As Laura was saying, you know this this kind of it's counterproductive for for someone like Facebook to change the algorithm because it's all based on advertising revenue. So you know turning that ship around is is going to be incredibly difficult. But you know what are the areas where where we can look at? You know how do they how do they actually have impacts on people's lives? You know all this stuff around body image. And there's a lot of kind of negative connotations with 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 the way that the algorithms work. And I think we need to do a better job of understanding that. And I think, you know, people are, there's a lot of work going on at Stanford. There's a lot of work going on at Columbia and you know, Emily Bell at Columbia and you know, Nathan uh, Pasilli at Stanford. You know, there's a lot of eminent uh, academics. Tim himself will know this as well in, in that lane that I think needs to be supported because, you know, I don't think Facebook's going to just suddenly, you know, keel to congressional pressure. You know, they don't turn up to, you know, when they've been subpoenaed. So, you know that that's part of the problem. They're so huge that they 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 just behave how they like. So um, you know, I think there's there's stuff that needs to be done. You know, certainly in terms of um, how they open up their data. Yeah, Tyler. Well, and to that point, um, just a little bit with with my background, you mentioned that I was a, a in the state senate, and when we talk about information and getting it local, that investment, getting those local leaders involved, and that's what I do appreciate with one country project kind of taking the the lead on trying to get back there because it, uh, as was mentioned earlier by uh, JD, I, I started ND Explains because it wasn't necessarily that there was mis or disinformation. There was just no information uh, going on in North Dakota. We would go out to the legislature. We have biennial sessions and I'd come home to my district every weekend and nobody would know what the hell was going on in the legislature that week, which is the, the crux of starting uh, this website. And, uh, we had some success, and now as to what Will was talking about with the algorithms, Laura, before, uh, the change that happened, I think you can almost pinpoint right in 2018, to where it was all about that you're getting more interaction, more eyes, or something that outrages you instead of just instead of just finding the information that was important, which was the intent of starting some of this stuff. And I think, you, as Art was talking about with the paper, you, you want to provide the information, but if you don't have the means through this this platform of Facebook or whatever it might be, I think the the conversation needs to go in these areas to find who is that that local individual that's trusted that can deliver the information that, you know what, is actually going to gain the attention of those in that community of 450 people. Uh, Because I think, Will, you're right. I mean, the the algorithm conversation, I don't think it's going anywhere. I, I wish it were. But until we find, you know, an equal way of doing it, which is going to take a lot more effort an investment, I think, outside of social media platforms. Uh, I don't know how we go beyond spinning tires on this. Yeah, and Tim, I think you wanted to chime in on this. Uh, yes, I. First of all, I wanted to say that was truly a fascinating presentation by Laura. Um, absolutely, especially that first chart just blew my mind. Uh, the moving video, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if she's still there, but I still wonder and it's something we should keep in mind we're we're talking right now in an online sort of format and we're talking about online media and news outlets and all of that right now um so laura um discussed how they're sort of measuring a correlation between sort of the changing of the media space and changing of voter outcomes the que- the real important question though i think is does it actually, which way does the causal error go? And Will kind of pointed to, towards that question already is, the question is, does the information, the changes in information actually change the voter outcomes and sort of the polarization or is polarization caused by something else? And then people simply select the information they want to get. So we're not actually, and Laura pointed that out as well, Facebook and and all the others, they're not actually putting out information. They're basically putting out entertainment, right? They're giving people what they want and based on a deep understanding of their cognitive function. 
right? So, so that's, I think, the key question here. Does it actually matter? Because if, if polarization is already there and then that cha uh, shapes how people select information, then, then we need to start somewhere else, right? The work needs to start somewhere else. And that goes to a point Tyler and Art, um, everybody essentially made. COVID especially has been really damaging, right, to communities, be they rural or urban. Um, and what Art was saying about his acquaintance who's no longer talking to him, now everything is taking place online, or a lot of conversations, right? People have sort of withdrawn towards home, which makes the importance of social media seem so much bigger. So I think one big way we have to re-engage is to seek out those personal connections, right? I talked, I read one interview in Wheaton, Wheaton, Illinois, and it's not on the record, so I didn't put it in a book, but I know I can, I can, I can talk about it. I asked the person we interviewed, um, so there's all this increasing polarization. And the answer was, he answered, no, there isn't. And then I realized he's not on social media. He refuses to go on any social media. He has, uh, he's liberal, very liberal. He lived in Wheaton, right? One of the most conservative places, uh, probably in Illinois. And he said, I talked to my neighbors. They're super nice. Uh, I don't care what they believe in politically. I'm not on social media. I don't experience polarization. So again, it's kind of emphasizing my point, but we need to go out there. And talk, and and this is what we experienced during during the interviews. It actually was easier for us to do these interviews, I think, because we were not from a media outlet, right? We just met those people and we started a conversation, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, we can actually talk about Donald Trump, which is very difficult for others. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, and um, you know, that's one thing that was my campaign philosophy was getting out there and trying to talk to as many people as possible. Um, but, the, the, there is this blend where, uh, uh, the minute I mentioned I was a Democrat, then there's this disgusted look on their face. <laughs> uh, even though they agreed with me on, on policy stuff and, and, uh, it was one of those things where it, you learn that, okay, there's some people you'll never, uh, connect with. Uh, but but I, I do feel, though, like I talk about my neighbor all the time who has the truck the size of Texas uh, a caucus for Trump and had f five AR-15s. You, you wouldn't think we get along too well, but we actually agree on most things. But but then when we go on social media stuff, it just we're we're f almost forced to go the other way. I, I will push back on a little bit. And it, it is a question. Is it the chicken or the egg type of thing? Are are these people already naturally going this and they're clicking on it or vice versa? Uh, I, I know that I don't have the stat off the top of my head, but the, the percentage of people who joined, uh, uh, I, I guess, hate groups, they would they would say from Facebook, uh, they they didn't they weren't searching for it. It was offered to them. And, and that's the part that I feel where the manipulation is, is really coming into. I mean, that's just an example. Um, uh, uh, if Laura is around, I do have one more question for her. Uh, uh, but if, if she's not, uh, it, it's all right. Uh, I just want to, on one tiny thing, because you brought this up, and it's, it's a, I think that's the most important point. We had this answer from a lot of people, too. Americans actually agree on most things, right? We agree yeah. on most things. And that's very important because when you go on social media, you think like there is just total war out there. Mm -hmm. And it's not actually the case. And we should also try not to fall into that trap ourselves, right? There is still yeah. hope. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> and that's why I decided to run for office. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm forever an optimist, I guess. Um, uh, but so uh, I guess, uh, Tim, there was a question to you. Uh, 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 I, I want to quickly get to was you said uh, or the question is, what was the word that you would recommend instead of using divided or polarized? And I know we've all been using it, but uh, you mentioned that during your your uh, presentation. 
Um, yes. Well, again, I also use the term polarized because um, it captures a lot of the what's going on. But yes, I would use fragmentation. Um, and it was actually not my, my I, I got the idea from a workshop from a student at a workshop in Leipzig uh, two weeks ago. So Malte, if you're watching from Erfurt, then thanks to you. So fragmentation is... I, I was wondering if it work, uh, if it's a good term when I watched Laura's presentation, um, because she does show polarization. But then again, she also, the, the first video with the bubbles was already sort of, uh, polarization because she colored it in red and blue, right? But I think you actually see a lot of, um, fragmentation within the red and blue camp. So there's a lot of progressives who even within the very progressive cam, there's a lot of disagreement, right? There's the AOC versus Bernie Sanders. There's more, like more social justice versus anti-capitalist. And then you have that whole group uh, against sort of more moderate Democrats as we've seen. Um, so I think when we think about the current situation in terms of fragmentation, we get a different picture and we might come up with different strategies on, on how to address the current situation because you have it on the on the right too we had a uh, presentation somewhere else where some trump supporter was like no we're not republicans right we don't care what mitch mcconnell says like we're, we're trump people like it's completely different i just we just were at a lunch with uh uh high-ranking republican from california and he seemed to be not a big fan of Donald Trump, right? So um, if we constantly think about it only in two camps, then we might also miss a bunch of opportunities sort of to to pick and and win people over, right? Because again, there's a lot of overlap on on particular issues. And I think it's much easier if we start finding commonalities rather than just constantly thinking in terms of two two opposing camps. Yeah, uh, I, I've noticed a lot behind the scenes, a lot of people are more open to criticize Trump than in front of a camera. But uh, <laughs> that's just my experience. Uh, Laura, while we have you, I have one uh, a question I really wanted to ask you. And it was about the profitability. Uh, and I think that's a point that doesn't get talked about enough is the, the profitability of all these uh, uh, right wing and, and conservative uh, uh, media and and so what is it that it, was there a time that they just took off with this or, or was it one of those things that it's just kind of uh, been an evolution from like what art mentioned the rush limbaugh uh on, on radio but but for whatever reason the conservative side of things have really profitized this and and there's no incentive to not continue to do this if it's making profit for for uh, the media for themselves and, and all this stuff. And, and so where has the liberal side of this, uh, I guess, got it wrong or, or it's not profitable or, or what's, could you talk a little bit about uh, both the evolution and the dynamic of, of the two sides? In terms of the evolution, I think that there was, as I say, in the old media environment, there was very limited shelf space. So there was a bunch of narratives that were really not getting presented. The Bernie narrative has been around for a long time. The Black Lives Matter narrative has been around for a long time. The Breitbart narrative has been around for a long time. But they weren't getting much airspace. Um, and I think that there were some folks uh, who felt that the mainstream media space, including entertainment, was leaving their themselves, their audience, you know, out of the picture. I mean, you could say that for people of faith, you know, evangelicals just felt like there wasn't room, on, you know, where, where are we? So there was more energy into uh, building media properties and trying to, you know, attract an audience into a new space. And because of that, you had, I think, expertise that was created more on the right for doing that kind of, of enterprise building. And on the left, I think there was a little bit more, hey, we, we were comfortable operating inside this media environment. You know, we, we have enough shelf space right here. So we're just going to focus on, you know, advertising. We have a built in industry on the left of, you know, people who are good at making ads. Um, so there's a little bit of a disparity there. 
but I, I would say there's one other thing too uh, that is a difference in strategic approach. Um, and I wouldn't want to attribute it just to right and left, but there are folks now who are in the media space who are starting from the content mm-hmm. place. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about climate change. I want to talk about, you know, you know, migrants on the border, whatever. And and I want to figure out how to say it in a way that will get people to come to what I want to talk about. That's a big difference from folks who say, I am interested in this audience. So the first thing I'm going to do is really see what they're gathering around already. Right. And I'm going to invest in that. And then I'm going to try to join that conversation. So it's an audience centric strategic approach versus a content centric approach. Uh, media approach. And I think, especially in this new digital environment, where so many things are fractured, looking and understanding what people naturally gather around and then figuring figuring out how to, you know, be part of that conversation is having more success Mm -hmm. both commercially and in terms of politics. And I think not to think about that, that way is equivalent to taking people on the longest, worst date ever, where you're endlessly saying, let me tell you more about me. <laughs> Instead of saying, tell me about you. And that fundamental strategic shift is not one I think that has been sufficiently made in all places. And that is critical, 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 critical. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, uh, Art, uh, you've been, and, and I guess uh, uh, this will go for Tyler too a little bit. Um, uh, but Art, you, you've been around the caucus uh, this last cycle. You've been around the block uh, for for Northwest Iowa and journalism. How do you see, I guess, from your perspective, you, you're very well consumed with the local stuff. How did you see the national media and the difference between national and local uh, during the caucus? Um, because I, I, I'm just very curious on... on um, d- kind of that that dynamic because i people love to blame oh the media blah 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 so yeah um <clears throat> well you know first of all it's obvious that the national media is you know most interested in the horse race journalism and uh that's because people want to know who's going to win and uh and who's winning and that's the way american politics is set up uh, we tried to start a conversation about rural America during the caucuses. Uh, you were involved in that. And uh, at the grassroots level with the Iowa Farmers Union, we got, had the first major candidates for them here in Storm Lake, Iowa, where we had Elizabeth Warren, Julian Castro, Tim Ryan, Amy Klobuchar. And, um, and the national media really wasn't interested in that story of what's happened to rural America in the last, since Ronald Reagan's time, but it's, it's been, it's been drained out, gutted, knocked down and left for dead. And nobody, especially Democrats don't understand it and don't want to talk about it. And the media certainly doesn't. The other reflection I've had, I'd have on the media is that, um, uh, you know, uh, it's reflected really well in a, in a movie coming up called Storm Lake. It's about it's a documentary about uh, about the Storm Lake Times and us covering the caucuses. And Rachel Maddow and crew are increasingly impatient for the Iowa caucus results, which traditionally you might not get for two or three days uh, because they're so anachronistic. Uh, And it was just driving the media nuts. They need a winner now. Well, they don't understand fundamentally that the Iowa caucuses function is to winnow the field from 25 candidates down to six. It's not to declare a winner uh, in the first contest of the cycle. And uh, and it's also secondarily a party building exercise. It's not a primary. It's uh, selecting delegates and platform planks for the county convention. And the national media simply doesn't understand it. And uh, furthermore, the national media never picked up the story that the DNC ordered the Iowa Democratic Party to adopt their reporting app uh, from cell phones. And the damn thing, which was developed by the Clinton, former Clinton campaign people, it didn't work. Uh, But they forced 
the, uh, the Iowa Democratic and Nevada uh, Democratic parties to use that and then blamed the delay in reporting on those rural routes. And so here I am, uh, a progressive in Northwest Iowa, who's saying, okay, they fl they're flying over us again. They're, they're saying that we're just reverting to our guns, Bibles, and whatever else Obama was talking about. Huge mistake, uh, very much tin-eared. And uh, that's what I really want to start talking about is, is how the entire country has crapped on rural America for the last 40 years, and nobody cares about us, really. Uh, give them their corn ethanol subsidy and shut them up. And the fact is that, you know, 67 of Iowa's 99 counties lose population every year. They lose economic vitality. People are pissed off. And the Democrats didn't do a damn thing about it. And in 1990, when we started the Progressive Populist, a national political publication, uh, to counter the Rush Limbaugh, do you think we got a dime's worth of help out of D.C. or the Democratic Party? Hell no. How much, how much money did J.D. Shulton get from the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee? Zero, running against the most racist congressman in Congress, Steve King. And so we can talk about, all, you know, what we're not talking about is the underlying issues uh, that are ripping rural America apart. And it's by design. It's turning white people against brown people and black people by design because poor white trash has to look down on somebody to feel like they're part of the, of the, of the, the, the golden goose. Well, you're not part. You're not never going to have a gold plated toilet seat. So forget about it. And until Democrats start talking seriously about what happened, what's happening to our soil, our air, our water, the independent livestock producer, the, the, uh, the main street, uh, they're going to continue to be having these kind of conversations in rural summits. And it, it's frustrating as hell to me. Uh, and finally, if I may continue on my rant one more second, uh, all the, I'm a publisher. If, if you write a libelous letter to the editor or a tasteless letter to the editor, I'm going to kill it. I have a responsibility to because I don't want to get sued. Facebook is a publisher. It's not a platform. It's a publisher, and it deserves to be treated like a publisher. That solves the problem. Real simple. Eliminate that Section 230 waiver or whatever it's called and treat him as a publisher just like Tyler is. If he says something... Uh, outrageous on the air, the FCC is going to knock him off. So, uh, and if I say something outrageous in print, or if you, JD, read a letter to the editor and say something libelous or defamatory, uh, I'm the one responsible for it. Um, anyway, I'll shut up. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, no, that's that's great. Uh, Tyler, did you have anything you want to add? Well, what I heard with Art, a lot of uh, spot on points, and it goes back to something uh, that I had written uh, back in, I think it was 2016, following uh, that, that election loss was, uh, and I don't know that much has changed as far as, aside from projects like this uh, and some others that keep talking about us in rural America, but they're not really visiting with us to actually tell the story. I mean, to, to Art's point of the struggles here, I mean, I had a mayor from a town of about 700 people ask me, Tyler, how can I get involved in this infrastructure talk? Not federally, but even here in the state of North Dakota. And there is that disconnect, I think, of what led to, you know, the, the not the downfall, but the, the slip in where the status was in a small town uh, lifestyle to where it is now. And they're pointing the fingers at the wrong individuals. Uh, but we haven't been able to tell that story effectively because everything has become so nationalized. Uh, JD, you were talking about it, and I had the same experience. You go knocking doors, uh, running for a, a legislative uh, uh, for re-election for the Senate here in the state, and check off ninety percent of the things we all agree on. And then, well, which party are you running with? Why well, I'm running as a North Dakota Democrat? Instantly gone, and it wasn't necessarily because of the North Dakota Democrat. It's because in everyone's mind, it's been painted that you must be like one of those East Coast uh, elites. And until you get it back to telling the story that art is, and I think it's going to take time, it's going to take investment, it's not going to be cheap as we've been talking about here, until you can actually get that piece together to combat that narrative that has filled this void, it's going to be a long hill 
uh, to be climbing for quite some time. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is a good transition to you, Will. Um, so there is, uh, what you have to, what your job is and what you're working with one country is to try to get a feeling of what's out there in a place where we, we as rural folks tend to be underrepresented. And like, there's like, if right now, if you want to, uh, off the top of my head, I watched the Dodgers the Giants game last night. You can look all you want about the umpire, you know, that, that of the, the last play of the game, whatever. Um, but what you don't see is, is like what Art's talking about, this 40 years of what's happening in rural America. Like when I talk to all the presidential candidates uh, saying how we haven't really bounced back since the 2008 economic crisis, in, in, uh, let alone uh, anything sooner. And, and so how we haven't we, bounced back since the farm crisis, that, 1984. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. That's I mean, that's very fair. And so. What like how do you document what people are feeling in areas that we are we're flyover states where we're kind of forgotten? And so, can you talk a little bit about how you do it, and, and also um, what you see in these areas that that you're picking up that maybe like the national media is not not uh, uh, connecting with? Sure. So, um, I mean, a large part, and, and guys on the panel knows, but a large part of what what one country is trying to do is is bridge that gap, and and you know at least try and make some headway into that into that area where you know the democrat brand is completely ruined in rural areas in america and and you know trying to reconnect on on issues that are important to those people and, and sort of bring those to the fore and, and show that you know that there are organizations and there's funding for you know local journalism and all that great stuff that needs to go on but um you know it's, it's a drop in the ocean i guess but it, at least it's a start and so you know the way that we we look at it is we're looking at the online conversation you know we use humans we don't use algorithms to look at the data we're reading you know all the posts we're reading everything that rural people are talking about comments on the news articles that kind of thing um to get a sense of what you know how are they how are they discussing topics that are important to them so you know we see a lot on kind of you know farming issues soybean prices that kind of thing um that you know traditionally pollsters or people in the media might not be writing about and they might only be small you know when we were working with Heidi in in um 18 you know we saw a thing that was bubbling on around around soybean prices that no one else was talking about and we said look there's this there's this issue here you guys should do something about it so well the pollsters aren't saying anything yeah it's tiny but people are talking about it with a lot of passion you know there is these aren't big numbers there aren't hundreds of thousands of people but it's a really important issue to to certain communities and they were able to then take that into the campaign, you know, cut an ad and whatever it was. But, um, you know, I think that it's those, it's those kind of, it doesn't have to be big to be beautiful. It's, it, it has to be about something that strikes to the heart of those communities. And that, and they're the kind of things that we're trying to find through, through listening and understanding, you know, the hopes and fears of people in, in rural America. And I think that's really important. You can't, you can't connect with a community. You can't hope to build bridges with a community if you don't understand how they think and feel about things. Um, and, you know, the rural areas in, in America are kind of, you know, when we were working in about six or seven different states, all the flyover states, you know, these are big areas. So we're trying to group some of that stuff together, put them together as a kind of one big region and say, you know, here are the commonalities between these states. It's not just about, you know, North Dakota and South Dakota or Minnesota. It's about you know those rural states or the rural areas within those states. What are the what are the what are the themes and conversations we can we can discover that are happening across those states that that are common to all, to all rural areas? And how can we elevate some of those issues? And how can we make sure that people in those states understand that we're listening to them and we we care about the issues that they care about? Um, and then it goes, you know, to, to people like Art and, and you know and Tyler who are who are surfacing those through their media properties and and talking about it. Um, but I think it's really about getting under the getting under the hood of of you know understanding rural communities and, and, and you know what their hopes and fears are. Yeah, no, I I just find it so interesting. Like having been on the meetings of of seeing some of the data that you show, it just it's absolutely fascinating. To I, I think it's there's a lot of just misnomers on on what people are actually talking about out there. And I mean, in my my feeds are not characteristic of what's going out there and uh uh but uh yeah so it just fascinating work tim uh go ahead i also have a question for you when you're when you're done oh okay thanks first of all uh absolute amazing rant art thank you for that it's it's really terrific i think 
Th that's kind of what I'm trying to say in really bad ways all night. We have to start about the actual issues, right? The politics, what's actually going on. And once again, I heard exactly, pretty much exactly the same thing from a very hardcore Trump person who said, you know, Democrats, you treated like workers and farmers like they're dirt under your fingernails. Um, this is the actual issue. That's the actual issue. And, and, um, the only the one thing I wanted to to also bring to the attention is we have very similar problems here in Germany, right? We, uh, the rural urban divide um, that's also very real here. Um, and I, I will knows this much better than I do, but I, uh, we're gonna drive through Germany and do the same project we've done in the United States and talk to people. That's part two of the Christ of the West series. And then we're going to the UK, right? Which is um, also going to be very interesting. But we suspect, and we already have lots of people who, who said that, that we have the same sort of issues here. And that's really puzzling to me, right? I mean, it's really interesting because it's not, you have like Syrian refugees here in Europe and you have, you know, Mexican and Latin American refugees in, in the U.S. So different stories, but they all have, we have the same problem. The one thing I want to actually, yes, still also remind everybody of is we need to talk to people like Art does. Uh, we need to actually talk to people. And that's why we drove all this way across the United States. It's a lot of work. It costs us a ton of money that we didn't have um but that's the only way the farmers that i showed you uh, or tom showed you earlier from nebraska yes they are on facebook not but not really right if you really want to talk and know what they what they think and what they feel um then you need to sit there at the kitchen table um and um, i think you get just very different information from from the online conversation and the real conversation right so you had a question, right? Yeah, yeah. here we go. Uh, reading it here. Um, so how do we know that those who consume misinformation know that they are being fed misinformation? And uh, this person mentions many of uh, her neighbors do not seem to understand the difference between a reliable and unreliable news source. And so just in, in your trip, can, if you had any of those experiences, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, how do we know? Well, we don't have quantitative data. We don't have you know, the data that Will collects. We don't have the data that Laura collects. That's definitely true. So in that sense, our evidence is qualitative. And people just tell us. I mean, they're like, yes, we are aware that this is all a bunch of baloney um, getting handed around, right? Um, we had a left-leaning, a very left-leaning Democrat who unsubscribed from the New York Times because she was like, it's getting increasingly editorialized. Um, people are actually not that simple-minded, to put it nicely, right? Um, and we have the conversation in the national media and on all the social media, the whistleblower story. I mean, it basically told us what we all know already, right? Facebook's trying to make money of us. And the conversation there is terrible. We know that. Everybody knows. Everybody we talked to knew that. Not a single person actually thought, oh, yes, Fox News is just giving me facts. So, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's very fair. Uh, I, we have just uh, a little over 10 minutes left. Uh, so we'll do a couple more questions here. Uh, but uh, mentioned this question is about uh, yesterday. Uh, one of the Wisconsin Farmers Union, uh, Julie Bomer, talked about canvassing uh, and asking people what keeps you up at night and who do you blame as nonpartisan way to engage. Uh, what answers to those types of questions have the panelists heard uh, from people? Uh, I think I'll start with Tyler since you probably, um, this is probably a lot on your radio show and everything so so uh, can you get to the the crux of the question again there jd i'm sorry yeah it's basically uh, when you talk to people especially on the other side of the aisle or whatever or, or when you're out canvassing it's what keeps you up at night and and who do you blame 
unfortunately, a lot of them in rural North, uh, rural North Dakota blame Democrats for a lot of things. And that's where getting to Art's uh, very eloquent rant earlier without explaining who and why and the decisions that fed into it uh, as to why we are where we are right now, that they've been they've been told the whole other narrative that it's uh you know, it's Democrats are allowing people to cross the border because, you know, what the whole replacement thing that Tucker Carlson spews on Fox News at night, uh, it, they probably to an extent think, well, this is kind of BS, but it, it's it's believed enough because they're not told, you know, with the the correct information enough times to to kind of uh, simmer that emotion down. I, I think uh, there there's that whole. Uh, they wake up looking to see what the next outrageous thing is going to be, and that's what keeps them up at night that night. And it might not be the same thing that was keeping them up the night before, but the blame is on media, Democrats, and illegal immigrants. And are those illegal immigrants coming from Canada since you're in North Dakota? Well, the border's <laughs> been closed, they say, but no, uh, it's never been uh, any of our uh, Canadian friends coming down for shopping at West Acres Mall in Fargo. That's been on the radar. <laughs> Art, did you have something to say? Or no, I just agree that that we've been fed a steady diet of bullshit, uh, you know, and the the Democrats are not there to answer it, uh, or people fact based uh, people either, you know. And uh, I, I just want to endorse what Tyler was talking about because, uh, you know, we're out here by ourselves, and you you know what I'm talking about, JD. And and Washington D.C. Democrats don't give a damn about how Iowa has taken a hard right turn, and they haven't done a freaking thing about it. Yeah, right now I talk doing stuff like this. Uh, I talk a lot about how Iowa is geographically between Wisconsin and South Dakota, and politically we're we're in between those as well, and we have a decision to make which way we're going to go. And there's been a disinformation machine that's been built, and you know, and, and people's heads are full of it. And Democrats sit on the sidelines. And uh, again, they didn't invest in you. They don't invest in me. And uh, so you get what you pay for. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, all right, uh, it, we're, we're gonna. I'm gonna go around and just kind of. Uh, if anybody has any parting words, but I, I, I also want to make sure that people know. Uh, I know Art, you got a movie and a book. Uh, Tim, you got a book. Uh, uh, Tyler, you got a blog and a radio show, and and will promote um, uh, social impact. So uh, I'll start with uh, since I see you, Tim, up here. I'll I'll start with you and and uh, just whatever you got in the last few words. And where can we find you? And where can we get your book? Oh yes, well I I thought I was I was already doing enough self promotion here for the book, so. Um, but yes, you find it at transatlantica with a K uh, dot com on November first. We're we're still working on all that. It's a very small operation, but we have uh, people in America, in Michigan, in uh, a very um, someone who now lives in Calgary, but who is from from Missouri. So we have a rural um, workforce here as well. No, I, I as parting words, I, I just wanted to say this has been a really terrific experience. I think I wish we could have done this in person. Maybe we get a chance to do this in person. I think we need like another two, three days at least. Uh, uh, Art probably needs a beer. <laughs> but I, I think the conversation turned out uh, really, really nicely into the actual issues. And that's really what's missing. And that's the one thing I heard from everybody. We're not talking about the real issues here. Uh, this is what's frustrating people the most. So I think this was very refreshing here. Really great workshop. I'm very glad that we could be part of it. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, I will say I am extremely blessed. Uh, that art uh, is part of our community in, in Northwest Iowa. And just if, if folks don't follow him, uh, you should follow him. Um, he, I feel he has the pulse on what's happening in the Midwest uh, as a Democrat. And so uh, 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 with that, Art, uh, do you want to let folks know where they can find you and, and uh, mention your book and, and the movie? 
Great. Yeah. Well, okay. The movie is, it's called Storm Lake and it's a documentary uh, by an Iowa film producer, uh, uh, director named Jerry Reishas. He grew up on a hog farm at Buffalo Center, Iowa and Beth Levison. And it's just a kind of a treatise on civic engagement. And that's really what we're talking about here and how in the absence of facts, this cancer of disinformation grows. And that's really what the movie dwells on. And, and about how, about civic engagement and how uh, uh, subscribing to your local newspapers is striking a blow for democracy. And so that's, I also have a book called uh, Storm Lake, uh, <laughs> very inventive with my titles, uh, Storm Lake. And uh, it's, it, it, again, it's pretty much like the documentary. It's about our newspaper and uh, our community, uh, which is about half Latino because uh, of meatpacking town and uh, and about kind of the history of Storm Lake uh, that used to be a pretty, uh, you know, we all got along and now we're not. And, uh, uh, and so I, I think we can, we can, we can have a more balanced conversation um, if people uh, are willing to support their local newspapers and, uh, and in the absence of that, I think we're in deep trouble. Okay, so your movie, thank you. You bet. Your movie Storm Lake, uh, your book Storm Lake, and what's your newspaper called? Uh, Stormlake.com. <laughs> www.stormlake.com is our website, the Stormlake <laughs> Times. And thanks, JD. I really do appreciate it. You bet. I also see in the comments we got uh, former Senator Doug Jones, who also mentioned. Uh, that he can say firsthand Democrats have also ignored the South and we have paid the price. So, Doug, if you want to reach out, I got some ideas how we can uh, uh, fight back. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Will, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I just uh, thanks, JD, and and thanks to fellow panelists. It's absolutely uh, very interesting to to hear what you guys got to say. I just want to say thank you to the One Country Project and to Heidi Hyde Camp and the and the board um, for for keeping up the good work and. Um, you know, investing in in understanding and engaging in rural communities, and I think you know it's a, it's a great blueprint for for other states that and other rural areas in in the country. And um, yeah, I think you know the the Democrats have got a huge amount of work to do to to reconnect with rural audiences, and I think you know they've got a massive catch up to do with 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 Republicans in terms of owning the narrative, and and you know that's that's a lot of work that needs to be done. And People on the call already saying, you know, um, on the on the panel, we were saying, you know, that that, that ignore the rural communities at your peril and let's cross fingers, but um, it's not looking so good for the midterm. So um, we'll see. But um, yeah, hopefully there's 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 get some some momentum and and more investment in rural communities. I think it's an important thing through local media, through through the institutions, the academic institutions, through understanding the the opinions and and, and hopes and fears of rural folk. Appreciate that. I appreciate that, Will. And then, uh, Tyler, do you want to uh, close things out here and, and mention uh, where people can find you? Yeah, you bet. Well, first, I want to thank everyone. The panel was very fun. I, when I got the invite, I was wondering, what in the world? How do I fit in here? And, uh, uh, <laughs> you guys have been great. I do appreciate it. Uh, the, the work, uh, again, started, uh, I think, out of the need of what we're discussing, that the need's still there uh, across the rural America of, you know, finding those voids in information and, and finding somebody or, or finding groups of individuals that are willing to put the time, effort, money into to putting the, the correct information out there because we've had success with it. But, you know, after when it comes to electoral success, we haven't quite gotten there yet. And when it comes to what we've been saying about the, the National Democratic Party, where are they at, you know, after 2020, uh, or even 2018, it's like, oh, we're going to come back. We're going to come to you. And it's 2021, and I haven't seen it yet, aside from things like this with the One Country Project. Uh, here in North Dakota, I have NDExplains.com, where we explain North Dakota politics. It's become more of an accountability thing to what's actually going on because there's such a super majority. Our entire federal delegations uh, all from the same party. And uh, quite frankly, they've got a pretty big staple when it comes to local media as well. So that's where I focus on. Uh, the North Dakota politics, ndexplains.com. You can follow me on Twitter. It's just at Tyler Axness. And then if you want to listen to some good old fashioned AM radio, we're now on the FM dial, but you can find us at kfgo.com and listen live. Uh, my show starts in about two minutes. So I'm going to run to that studio and get rolling, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd love to come on sometime. I'll drive up to Fargo for you. You just answer the call. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank so, you. Well, I, I am so honored to be uh, on this with, uh, I, I love this all. I, we have uh, Germany, we have uh, England, we got Art, we got Fargo, and, and Laura was fantastic. So uh, I just want to thank uh, One Country for, for bringing us all together. Uh, I, I, this is the reason why I decided to be a board member was for, for things like this. Uh, it's so important to hear all of uh, this uh, and, and to hear so many different perspectives. Uh, so with, with that, I just want to thank you all for such a, a fascinating conversation and discussion. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Kale Weston. Uh, Kale, I hope you're ready. And uh, he's going to be leading a discussion, uh, which I'll be also uh, on the, uh, the, the panel side, of, of former candidates uh, from 2020. So, Kale, here we go.